probably out having an affair somewhere. It's Jim Taylor. He wants to know who you're having an affair with. Well, whoever she is, she sure likes to read a lot. Relationship goals. Anyway, Buster has bought a bunch of misery books so he can read them and see if there are any clues as to what happened to Paul. It's a long shot, but it's not like there's much else he can do at the moment. Again, see how much funnier this is when you think of Misery as being the Twilight of this movie's universe? Can you imagine being at the bookstore and seeing this guy buying a bunch of Twilight books? What do you expect to find? A story about a guy who drove his car off a cliff in a snowstorm? You see, it's just that kind of sarcasm that's given our marriage real spice. Later that night, it's dinner date time. It looks wonderful. So do you. Aw, look at Annie all dolled up. Naturally, Liberace is playing in the background. Wow, she's so nervous. I've never had meatloaf this good. What do you do to it? To give it that little extra zip, I mix in some Spam with the ground beef. Can't get this in a restaurant in New York. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound bad to me, honestly. Maybe I'm just weird. Anyway, Paul pours the wine. <laughs> <laughs> to misery. Wait. And then asks if she has any candles to get her to leave the room for a minute. So here's the payoff for the novel he's been saving up. He dumps it all into her glass. To Misery and to Annie Wilkes, who brought her back to life. Oh, Paul! Oh, 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 oh. So much for that good idea. The funny part is that she never had a clue about this plan, so if she hadn't been so clumsy, it might have worked. Can we pretend this never happened? Which makes it just that much worse for Paul. The whole subplot of Paul trying to poison Annie with Novril actually wasn't in the book, so if you read the book first, you could probably predict that it wouldn't work. But it's still kind of a nice touch. Also, how awkward was the rest of that dinner date, I wonder? Cue a montage of Paul writing. Annie reading Paul's manuscript. And Buster reading misery books. We also see that Paul has been exercising his arms. The one in the sling is clearly healed by now, but he's hiding that from Annie. I love the classical music piece that plays here. And of course it's Liberace. Annie shows up to give him his pills for the night, and she's down again. Annie, what is it? The rain. Apparently, among other things, she suffers from a variation of seasonal affective disorder. When you first came here, I only loved the writer part of Paul Sheldon, but now I know I love the rest of him, too. And she opens up a little, and we learn a little more about her motivation. You're a beautiful, brilliant, famous man of the world, and I'm not a movie star type. You'll never know the fear of losing someone like you, if you're someone like me. Damn, that's heavy. Book's almost finished. Your legs are getting better. Soon you'll be wanting to leave. Why would I leave? I like it here. He's so full of shit. So it turns out that Annie has a gun. Fortunately, it's not loaded. Yet. Sometimes I think about using it. I better go now. Ironically, Paul feels like he just dodged a bullet. After Annie pulls away in her vehicle, Paul makes it back to the kitchen and grabs a big knife. Meanwhile... What? Their whole misery into court. Of course there was a book that involved a trial. Paul probably just threw every dramatic cliche into that series. Anyway, there's a particular line that grabs Buster's attention, so he writes it down. There is a justice higher than that of man. I will be judged by him. Back to Paul, he finds a photo album sitting open on a table to articles about his presumed death, so naturally he looks through it. After some old pictures of Annie, there's an article where, if you pause and read it, it's about how Annie's father died from having fallen down the stairs when she was 11. And then there's another article about someone falling to her death in the same way, this time a nurse. Then one about Annie graduating from nursing school with honors. More articles about her becoming head maternity nurse, along with one on the death of a pediatrician. And then an article on the death of a baby, and another. At this point, people began to suspect her and she was questioned about the infant deaths. But I guess she got away with it and more were killed. 
And then finally she was arrested. I do think it's interesting that there are various mundane little keepsakes like greeting cards and pictures of Misery the Pig stuck into various places. It's like she thinks of all these murders and such as just kind of a normal part of her past along with that other stuff. I just find that interesting. Anyway, Paul manages to get back into his room and back into bed before Annie gets back this time. And he's already thinking about how he's going to use that knife. Sometime later, he hears Annie come back, and she approaches the door. But ends up walking away. Not tonight, Paul, sorry. So he hides the knife under the mattress. See you in the morning. Not if she sees you first. Wow, there's a rude awakening. Then during the day, he wakes up again, clearly drugged. I know you've been out. Talk about out of the frying pan and into the fire. Paul, oh, my little ceramic penguin in the study always faces due south. I've heard people complain about her noticing the ceramic penguin facing the wrong way, like that's too small of a detail for her to notice. Keep in mind that Annie has all sorts of mental issues and obsessive compulsiveness wouldn't be a stretch. Also look at these knickknacks and notice they were all facing the same direction originally. Had she knocked it down herself, she most likely would have put it back the right way. Is this what you're looking for? Look at poor Paul's expression drop. That knife was his only hope. So if you haven't figured it out by now, this is the famous hobbling scene. Last night it came so clear. I realize you just need more time. Eventually you'll come to accept the idea of being here. And speaking of classical music, this is the best use of Moonlight Sonata since Resident Evil. My interpretation is off a little. I love how until now Annie has been someone who doesn't seem too bright. And it did apparently take her a while to figure out that Paul has been out of his room, so there is some truth to that. And usually, Paul generally has the upper hand in the intelligence department. It's possible that Annie is smarter than she's been letting on, but more likely she just thinks she is because she managed to figure out what Paul was up to. Either way, she's in rare form here, as suddenly she's giving us a history lesson about the Kimberly Diamond Mines and what happened to the workers who stole diamonds. They had to make sure they could go on working, but they also had to make sure they could never run away. The operation was called hobbling. Yeah, I don't think that's going to make him feel any better. Hey, please! Ah! Almost done. Gotta love how casual she is about all this. One more. Clinical, even. <laughs> William Goldman, the writer of this movie, has said that the movie was meant to be kind of a twisted love story, at least from Annie's perspective. Like, she's doing this out of love. And now that she's made it so that they can continue to be together, she's relieved. God, I love you. Man, that's creepy. By the way, back when I had this on VHS, I couldn't resist watching the bit where she hits the first foot in slow motion. Watching Paul's foot bend at a 45 degree angle to the side was morbidly fascinating. Later on at some point, no, Buster hears Annie's version of cussing someone out, and it seems to get the gears turning. What is it? Well, I'm not sure, maybe nothing. Well, I'm glad you found it. There's that spice again. So he goes to the library and looks up old newspaper articles, eventually coming across one about Annie's trial. She told the reporters, There is a higher justice than that of man. I will be judged by him. Which is the same quote that Buster had written down earlier. So in her big moment on the steps of a courthouse, she quotes a fucking romance novel. That's Annie, all right. Damn, it really sucks to be Paul. Notice how it looks like he's in jail. That's a nice touch. Such a kidder. I thought Annie didn't like swearing. Maybe it's a context thing. Here. Meanwhile, Buster goes to the general store and asks about any recent yeah, unusual purchases made by Annie. Same old stuff. Lest you call paper on. Newspaper. Typing kind. Well, that kind. Nothing odd about that. Finally, he seems to have an idea of what's going on and he heads off to Annie's house. But Annie is ahead of him and drugs Paul and stashes him in the basement. What can I do for you? Well, I was wondering, do you happen to know anything about Paul Sheldon? What doesn't she know? 
Well, he was born in Worcester, Massachusetts, 45 years ago. The only child of Franklin and Helene Sheldon, mediocre student, majored in history. Again, pre-Wikipedia. That's pretty impressive. I'm his number one fan. I've got all his books, every sentence he ever put down. I'm so proud of my Paul Sheldon collection. Of course, she plays the part of the eccentric but harmless fangirl. Whenever I get to this scene, I'm always caught off guard by how short she actually is. She looks so much bigger and more imposing from Paul's perspective, which is how we've mostly seen her until now. Apparently, Kathy Bates is five foot three, so she is not a tall woman. When I was praying, God told me to get ready. Get ready for what? Anyway, she seems to already know what led him there, and she talks about how she plans on continuing Paul's work. He gave so much pleasure to so many people. There's a shortage of pleasure on the planet these days, in case you hadn't noticed. Off topic, but I love that old-fashioned wool coat that Buster is wearing. I think my dad had a coat like that. Oh, look at me. You'd think I'd never had a guest before. Would you like a nice hot cup of cocoa? So Annie leaves him alone for a bit, so he steals a quick look around the place. Meanwhile, Paul is starting to wake up. Here you are. <laughs> that was great. Anyway, Buster seems to be thinking that this is a dead end, so he heads out. But as he's leaving, he hears a noise. So he goes back in to check on her. Miss Wilkes, are you all right? Come here! And finally finds Paul. Mr. Sheldon? Oh, Buster, no! Don't feel bad, Paul. It was bound to happen sooner or later. It's a sign. Annie has really gone off the deep end now and is planning a murder-suicide. I put two bullets in my gun. One for you and one for me which she is going to carry out immediately. When she leaves for a second, Paul spots a can of lighter fluid, probably the same one from when she made him burn his book earlier, and that gives him an idea. Now don't be afraid. I love you. I love you too. Whoa. We are meant to be together, and I know we must die. But it must be so that misery can live. We must finish the book. It's almost finished. Ooh, that was slick. Book, line, sinker, rod, and copy of Angling Time, sir. When she goes to get his chair, he grabs the lighter fluid and hides it. I'll fix you something to eat. I always thought it was odd that she leaves the chair there. She's seen to it that he probably can't crawl up those stairs. Maybe the idea is that she went to get the food ready and came back for him shortly afterwards while it was still cooking. So now it's back to business as usual at Annie's house. Oh, Paul, I'm dying. Does she wind up with Ian or Winthorn? I wonder if she's Team Ian or Team Winthorn. Anyway, he's only got one more chapter to go. I'll need three things. You need a cigarette because you used to smoke, but you quit, except when you finish a book. And the match is to light it. You need one glass of champagne. Dom Perignon. Dom Perignon. I'm almost done. So now he's almost done and asks her to bring those three items he needs to have after finishing a book. She also brings her gun. I like how you can tell that this is the calm before the storm because of that soft pink lighting. Always thought it was a nice touch how comfy the atmosphere seems in this scene. Did I do good? You did perfect. And goddammit if Annie doesn't have a certain charm to her. Except Paul asks for a second glass for her. Oh, Paul. And she's in a haze. As soon as she leaves, Paul gets ready for her return. Remember how for all those years nobody knew who Misery's real father was? It's all right here. God, that look of utter betrayal on Annie's face. Meanwhile, Paul is kind of enjoying this. Why not? I learned it from you. She dives for the book, trying to put it out as Paul expected. And remember how he was practicing lifting that typewriter earlier? <laughs> and now it's just a full-on brawl. <laughs> There's bullet number one. <laughs> And there goes bullet number two. Remember how I mentioned that the writer had a twisted love story in mind when he wrote this? Well, here's the twisted love scene. Though maybe it's a bit more like rape when Paul just lets out all those pent-up frustrations. She manages to get away from him, but... That's an oddly appropriate death. Though even this movie isn't immune from this horror cliché. Dead. 
death by pig. <laughs> and it's for real this time. 18 months later, Paul is able to walk, but only with a cane. Anyway, he meets with his agent, and we find that he managed to write yet another book. Though we don't know if it's a second attempt at the untitled one he had to burn, or if it's an entirely new one. I assume it's the latter. Either way, the book is critically acclaimed, so Paul has officially gotten back on his feet as a writer, as it were. I wrote it for me. I don't think I'm completely nuts, but in some way, Annie Wilkes, no experience, uh, helped me. She asks him if he'd ever be willing to write about his experience with Annie. Say, Marsh, if I didn't know you better, I think you were suggesting I dredge up the worst horror of my life just so we could make a few bucks. Don't worry, it's not really her. It's more that the mention of her caused a trigger. I still think about it once in a while. Excuse me, I don't mean to bother you, but are you Paul Sheldon? I just want to tell you I'm your number one fan. That's very sweet of you. He's like, kill me. I'll be seeing you. Play us out, Liberace. So that was Misery. This movie is amazing. Possibly the best Stephen King movie, at least before Shawshank Redemption came along. It stays true to a good amount of the book. Most of what changed involved toning down the violence and gore. The one that most people remember is the hobbling scene, which involved Annie chopping off Paul's foot and then cauterizing the stump, without any kind of anesthetic, of course, rather than breaking both ankles. One line I remember from the book is, blood splattered across her face like Indian war paint. What's kind of funny about it is that I remember Paul being able to walk a lot better on a prosthetic foot, so she'd done him a favor in a way. But there were other things as well, like, after Paul complained about the missing N on the typewriter, Annie responded by chopping off his thumb, and then later sticking the severed thumb onto a cake like a birthday candle. Also, this one isn't about gore, just how much more horrible Annie was in general. After the scene about swearing where she'd spilled soup on the floor, she cleaned it with a bucket of soapy water and then made Paul drink it. And while Buster isn't in the book, there was a scene where a police officer came and discovered Paul and Annie killed him, except she stabbed him with a wooden cross from the grave of one of her animals and then ran him over with a lawnmower. So the amount of gore in the book was quite over the top at times. Had they kept all that in, it would have been more along the lines of torture porn. God, I could so see Eli Roth remaking this like he wanted to do with the Bad Seed. He better not. I'm sure some people were disappointed with the lack of gore in the movie version, and I was kind of surprised about it when I first saw it, but honestly, I think the movie is better for it. Granted, it's been a long time since I read the book, so I'm sure my memory is fuzzy about some things. But I remember Paul as being... The long-suffering victim who we had endless sympathy for. In the movie, it might just be the way James Caan plays him, but he comes across like he has more power somehow. Instead of feeling sorry for him, we cheer him on. We just know he can get out of this somehow, and it's only a matter of time. Meanwhile, Annie is a lot more humanized. She comes across as having less control than she did in the book, probably because she isn't punishing Paul in horrific ways all the time. And she has some sympathetic moments. And, of course, Annie was described as basically a big, ugly, smelly blob, where in the movie she's better groomed, and, of course, Kathy Bates is adorable, so that probably helps. Also in the book, Paul immediately knew that she was crazy and dangerous. Pretty much right from when Annie said number one fan. Without any real lead-up to it or even any kind of specific reason for it. Like, it was just instinct. It wasn't a big deal, but I thought it was an odd choice. And this was before the movie, so there's no bias there. So I'm glad that the movie gradually works its way up to that. Early on in the movie when I said, she seems nice, yeah, I was partly being sarcastic because we know where this is going, but I also wanted to point out that Annie does genuinely seem nice in the beginning. And then eccentric, and then a bit scary. It's only when she finishes reading Misery's Child that we realize for sure that she is dangerous. Although one interesting thing that the book had going for it was that it was an allegory for addiction. For one thing, like I said, the subplot with Paul trying to poison Annie wasn't there. Instead, Paul actually got addicted to the novel. That could be considered another way that Annie tried to control him. Also, Annie, yes, she partly comes from his fears that his fans don't want him to write anything that isn't horror. But her keeping Paul captive was another allegory for drug addiction and how it controls you. He was quoted as saying, Annie was my drug problem, and she was my number one fan. God, she never wanted to leave. Naturally, that aspect is missing from the movie, but I think it'd be kind of hard to convey that through film. Hell, even in the book it was pretty subtle. I never did pick up on the symbolism of Annie's drug addiction until I read about it recently. 
Speaking of Annie, she's kind of a melting pot of psychological disorders. She's psychotic, delusional, bipolar, has personality disorder, is sadomasochistic, and has false moral standards. By the way, these disorders are often seen in individuals who stalk celebrities. There's a special feature on the DVD called Diagnosing Annie Wilkes, where a forensic psychologist analyzed her as if she was a real person, which is where I got all that. It's pretty interesting. I don't know how controversial this statement is going to be, but here goes anyway. I actually think this is one of those rare cases where the movie actually improves on the book. I'm not going to say that Annie has to be likable in any way, but I do think it goes a long way toward giving the story more depth. I think a villain is just that much more interesting if there's some small part of you, even if it's just the tiniest sliver that doesn't want to see them fail. So yeah, it might have been funny to see Annie run over someone with a lawnmower while screaming dirty bird and cock a duty, but I don't think we could have taken the movie as seriously. Although, apparently that's not why Rob Reiner wanted that stuff taken out. He did it because he wanted the movie to be more of a character-driven psychological thriller where two characters are trying to outwit each other, like a game of chess, and taking out or toning down some of Annie's more horrific deeds leveled the playing field a little. Also, Rob Reiner, for his part, could actually kind of relate to Paul's situation. He started off as a comedic actor. Little by little, piece by piece, you eat my heart out. I don't care. And in those days, breaking into directing was apparently a lot less common and harder to do than it is now. Not to mention that even though this was his second Stephen King movie, it was his first horror movie since Stand By Me was more of a coming-of-age story with dramatic and comedic elements. After that, he directed The Princess Bride and When Harry Met Sally. When it came time to direct Misery, he ended up watching a lot of Hitchcock films as research. So this project was kind of personal for him in a way. Not to mention William Goldman, who also hadn't really done anything horror-related before this. I love that one of the best Stephen King movies ever made was made by the two guys most responsible for The Princess Bride. That's amazing. Speaking of William Goldman, at the time this movie was being developed, Kathy Bates was mainly a stage actress, but Goldman was already a fan of hers, so he suggested her to Rob Reiner, who liked the idea of Paul being played by a well-known actor, since the character is a celebrity, and Annie being played by a mostly unknown actress, and the script was written with Kathy Bates in mind. I was so happy she won the award for this. Her acceptance speech is fairly run-of-the-mill, but there are a couple of cute moments in it. I would like to thank Jimmy Kahn and apologize publicly for the ankles. And I would like to say that I really am your number one fan, Jimmy. If you haven't figured it out by now, I love Kathy Bates. She always seems to play characters who are kind of unconventional and a little off-kilter. She was great in Fried Green Tomatoes. Tawanda. And say what you will about Titanic, but I loved her as the unsinkable Molly Brown. You gonna cut her meat for her too there, Cal? <laughs> she was also in a lesser known Stephen King movie, Dolores Claiborne. I think they were trying to make lightning strike a second time, but it didn't quite work out. Kathy Bates was nominated for her role in that one too, but didn't win, and people just don't seem to remember that one as well as Misery. It is a great movie though, and I'll probably talk about it someday. It is wonderful that Misery jump-started Kathy Bates' career and that she won an Oscar for her performance. But it's said that James Caan doesn't get as much credit as he deserves. I have to admit that I am a lot more familiar with Kathy Bates than I am with James Caan, so that's why I have more to say about her. I have seen him in other things, including a movie he was in last year called The Good Neighbor, which was also really good. But Misery is mostly what I know him for, so if I don't have a lot to say about him, that's why. Either way, he was great in this. James Caan is apparently someone with a lot of energy. In an interview, he refers to himself as hyper, so having to lay in bed for 12 hours a day was really hard on him. In fact, those times we see him looking miserable, at least some of that was probably not acting. And if nothing else, he's a great straight man in contrast to all of Annie's insanity. Sometimes it's his reaction to whatever weird thing she's doing that just really sells it. So I guess that's all I have to say about Misery. It's that kind of horror movie where most of the horror comes from the fact that you care about the characters and you're afraid for them. It's a psychological slow burn kind of horror movie, which relies more on tension than outright scares. Nothing wrong with scares and gore, but you've got to appreciate the kind of horror movie that's able to get under your skin without having to go that route. That's it for now. I'm sorry for prattling away and making you feel all oogie.
taught you how to do this stuff? I learned it from you. 